Are you considering divorce? Are you dealing with it now? Are you on the other side and not sure what comes next? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Divorce Do's and Don'ts Show with your host, Lisa C. Decker. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Lisa Decker, your host, and I am the CEO and founder of Divorce Money Matters and Divorce Town USA, the sponsor of this show, as well as a uh, certified divorce uh, financial analyst and a real estate collaboration specialist in divorce. And today, I am so happy that you're joining us because we are happy to welcome back to our show um, a privilege to have Bill Eddy. And Bill, if you want to come on camera, we want to see that wonderful smile of yours. And Bill is a family therapist, a family lawyer, a family mediator, and the co-founder and chief innovation officer of the High Conflict Institute. He is also the author of more than 20 books and manuals, and um, including, so what's your proposal? Shifting high conflict people from blaming to problem solving in 30 seconds. I want to hear about that technique. And for professional training, uh, mediating high conflict disputes, um, a breakthrough approach with tips and tools and new ways for mediation methods. So Bill, it is always an honor to have you here. We couldn't get a, a better expert to come and talk about dealing with high conflict spouses. So we are grateful that you are here with us today. Well, I'm always glad to be on with you, Lisa. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And and uh, you you and I were talking right before the show. You said that uh, you're happy to share ways that you learned the hard way, right? <laughs> share things you learned the hard way. We're going to help folks avoid some of that. So you know, negotiations are always a big part of the divorce process with all the decisions that have to be made. Can a person really negotiate with a high conflict spouse, even a bully? And if so, what are the some of the key points to remember? Yeah, I think so. And I spent many of the last 40 years doing mediation, helping people negotiate. But also, for 30 years overlapping with that, I've been a family lawyer. So negotiating one-to-one or with my client and the other party across the table and their lawyer. And so some key things I think I learned, like like you said, I learned the hard way. Uh, First is preparation so important, is be clear what 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 you want, what you're seeking, but also what you're willing to accept. Because what happens is in negotiations, there's always back and forth. So what you ask for uh, usually isn't what you end up with, but you need to be clear on those two things, where you're gonna start and where you need to end, after which it's not worth negotiating and maybe better to go to court or to use some other negotiation method. So preparing and having those in mind. But another thing that's really key is sometimes people just want to get everything over with. And so they just start uh, at the end and they say, look, this is what I can live with. Let's just do this and we'll be done. But especially high conflict, people always push further. So that's why you have to ask for more than you're willing to agree to at the beginning so there's a feeling that you've kind of you know had some give and take that way people don't feel like they're just going to push through so you can say i can't go any farther than this at some point in the process but if you start i can't go any farther than this you're going to be pushed farther than that and one more key thing and that is to stay calm and don't look desperate or in a hurry because a lot of times people feel in a hurry and you can easily be manipulated and pushed beyond what you need uh, if you imply that. So preparation, you know, know what you're asking for and don't look like you're in a rush. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And you know, so many of the cases that I see, <clears throat> um, well, first of all, 
many times people aren't prepared going to mediation. They're, they have not look to see whether the house that they're fighting for is something that they can afford to stay in or that they can qualify to refinance the mortgage or do a cash equity buyout. Um, you know, there's so many things that need to be determined before you get to the mediation table. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen over the years that I've been doing this, um, as well as, you know, starting at the end. Definitely, you give yourself no room for negotiation. So you always want to have some things that you're willing to give up to make the other person feel like they've gotten something. And uh, the desperation piece, you know, that is when people come to me or you're someone like yourself and say, I've got mediation in a week. Sometimes even I've gotten calls in a day and I need your help. And you haven't given the professionals enough time to really prepare to help you properly. So don't wait till the last minute and you won't be desperate as well. Couldn't agree more, Bill. Okay. So in your book, uh, so what's your proposal? You suggest a three-step process for making proposals and decisions. Can you describe the process and why it helps in difficult situations or any situation? Yeah. Yeah. So the three steps are one person makes a proposal and proposals usually include who will do what, when, and where, you know, picking up the child for the exchange for parenting time, um, when dollar amounts are paid for child support, things like that. Then the other person needs to ask questions about it and then simply say yes or no, or I'll think about it. And this really contains the discussion, because what often happens, especially with high conflict people, is you get into talking about the past and they argue with the proposal and say, well, that's a stupid proposal. Or why didn't you make that proposal a year ago? We could have saved $50,000 or whatever. And so this contains the discussion and helps you really focus. So I've taught this for many years in my mediations. And here's the part that you were suggesting earlier you wanted to hear about is getting people to shift from blaming to making proposals in 30 seconds. And how it works is I teach the method. I have people make some proposals, ask questions, and then say yes, no, or I'll think about it and go back and forth some, and eventually it leads to agreement. And then a new issue comes up and let's say, you know, you never picked up the kids at three o'clock in the afternoon to take them to karate. And rather than me saying, stop talking about the past or stop pointing fingers, I just say, so what's your proposal? <laughs> oh, my proposal is that he picks up the kids at three at the end of school and takes them to karate. And it's just so simple of a shift but it's not easy with high conflict people because they're so used to arguing and defending. And so if you're negotiating with a high conflict person, try to tell them, I'm just, I'm gonna give you a proposal and ask me questions about it and then say yes, no, or I'll think about it. Don't argue with me because if you don't like it, then you make a proposal and I'll ask you questions. And so you can go back and forth this way without having to get all heated up and stuck talking about the past and who should have done what, which is so often what happens with high conflict people. In fact, if you're wondering if you're a high conflict person, the question is, are you stuck in the past? Because if you can form a proposal for what to do in the future, that's really where the solutions are. Oh. That is amazing, you know, so simplistic and yet so powerful. And I love that, you know, you can apply this to other situations. Uh, are you teaching this to world leaders, Bill? We need this elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually actually been able to do consultations with a couple of politicians, but I don't think they're quite at the world leader level yet. More local stuff. But I think this is really the, the way the future has to go. And people are done arguing about the past, then we can get work done. So I hope someday somebody picks this up. <laughs> I hope so too. I love it. 
Oh, you have also helped develop a mediation method for professionals to use when helping clients make decision in divorce or any type of dispute. And it's described in detail in your book, Mediating High Conflict Disputes, which came out last year. Please briefly describe how this approach works, especially in high conflict disputes. Well, in this approach, there's kind of a shift from what a lot of mediators are used to uh, the, f the fundamental method for the last 40 years has been called interest-based negotiation, where people discuss their interests to understand, you know, what we each are looking for and, and what, how it really will help us or what it really looks like and fitting those interests together. Well, my experience as a mediator for 40 years, actually about 25 years, was that that doesn't really work with high conflict people. In many cases, there's one high conflict person and one reasonable person. Some are two high conflict people. And so over about a dozen years, I developed this method that doesn't start out discussing interests, but just goes right to people's proposals. So this is where it connects with what we've been talking about is so the mediator wants to keep the parties busy working on problem solving in the present because slipping into the past just blows up trying to give each other insight just blows up and to opening up emotions just blows up and so with high conflict mediation you want to keep it real narrow focused on problem solving so have the parties make their agenda the mediator helps the parties in this method make the agenda. So mm -hmm. thinking instead of reacting, and they get credit for the steps of the mediation process. Then making proposals with each of these agenda items, including the method we just talked about, proposal, questions, response, proposals, questions, response, and guide that process to keep it going slow so that people really listen to each other and then guiding them to make their final decisions. So what happens is in high conflict mediation, people are used to reacting and, and blaming. And by this structured step-by-step -step process, people stay focused on problem solving in the present and making decisions about the future without needing to argue about anything. So it's kind of like a treasure hunt. What's the solution going to be? Here's my proposal, here's your question's response, here's your proposal, my question's response, until we fit together to final decisions. And my experience is it works 80 to 90% of the time. And do you, do you allow any time for the folks, the couple uh, in caucus or not, um, to have some time to vent at the beginning of the mediation, because sometimes people just want to get it off their chest before they start. So I'm just curious about that. Yeah, this is one of the big paradigm shifts, because my experience with high conflict people is they don't get it off their chest. Sad to say, they don't go through the grieving and healing process, the five stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So when they, they just keep talking about their story, it's about the past, it's about how upset they are, and they often become more upset telling their story, and the other person becomes more upset because the story is usually about how the other person's a jerk. So what we've learned is to not open that, or if we really need to, to do that, is to do that separately. So mm -hmm. they're triggering each other and they're not escalating. So okay. instead, the beginning of the mediation discussion is focused on the present, the decisions we're facing today, questions about that, and information they may need to make today's decisions, like in terms of child support guidelines or property division, taxes, health insurance, parenting plans, not what happened in the past, because that's a trap and people keep trying to fix the past and it just doesn't work. So mm. why we skip that which is one of the big 10 paradigm shifts of this method. 
That's interesting. Do you, do you, as a part of all of your um, techniques, do you then advise that mediators meet with them possibly ahead of time and, and have conversation prior to coming to mediation? Sort of like mediation coaching, preparing yes. them for what the meeting is going to be like so that they've had time to get that out of their system be heard, which is so important to people, and yet yeah. understand that this day is going to be different. We're not going to handle those matters this way. We're going to do it differently. That's that exactly the success. That's exactly what we do. So we do pre-mediation coaching, individual with each party about a week before the mediation for about an hour, and tell them about the process and the part they'll play in it, then hear some about their story. So there is a place uh, for that, but as the mediator, I don't get hooked by that. And then I can redirect to how we're going to focus on problem solving. So, yes, yeah, so there is a place that people can do that. And by the way, I want to say this is, this is designed for high conflict people. So 80 to 90% of people in mediation, I think telling their story helps. It helps them understand each other. Um, it helps them see what each other's kind of looking for. But we find in high conflict mediation, it's so easy to slip into the emotions and drown in the emotions that we try to keep it focused on problem solving and nothing about the past. But that's the joint session. Individually, we do do some of that beforehand. Oh, and I think that's vitally important for people to understand because a yes. lot of times there's really no coaching that happens beforehand. So that's that's critical for high conflict cases. Yeah. Uh, I think that's important. Um, so let's see here. Um, can anyone benefit from using these methods? It seems like, you know, we we could apply this to workplace and to families and uh have you worked with others in in this respect and has it worked the same yes and we find what's interesting is we developed this for high conflict divorce and then we found we can do this with high conflict of any kind of dispute civil dispute construction defect disputes estate you know uh conservatorship disputes anything that's high conflict and then we found we can actually use this with everybody it doesn't go through as many steps as people are used to with mediation and some people say okay well we just got right to the point and we resolved our dispute and we don't need to really talk in more depth about the past or these other interest type of issues and so some people use this with all their cases. Um, I, I ended up my last 10 years mediation using starting all my cases this way. But then in the ones with reasonable people, I found I could talk about the past and maybe resolve some misunderstandings from the past. Mm -hmm. And that I could have people share some emotions and have some empathy for each other. That's real hard for high conflict people to do, so it's frustrating. But reasonable people can do some of that and say, you know, I can understand why that was upsetting to you, um, and I'm sorry, or whatever. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you can use these principles to simplify the process with anybody, um, but many people you can go beyond. But I, I want to say the fact you can use these in any kind of dispute, and you don't have to be a mediator. You can be resolving a dispute with your sister or your uncle or somebody um, just by saying, look, what do you propose? Or what do you suggest? Or what are your ideas? Or what are our options? And a funny story, I have to tell you, I once had a woman lawyer uh, come to one of my seminars, and she'd been to one the year before where she learned about proposals. And she said, Bill, I just want you to know I'm teaching my six-year-old son to make proposals. When he doesn't like something, I say, well, Johnny, what do you propose? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And honestly, I mean, this should be taught in schools as a part of, you know, problem solving um do you have a curriculum for for schools it 
the, the closest we have to that is a skills for uh, teenagers, for 12 to 17 year olds called New Ways for Life. And it was developed by myself and Susie Rayner, one of our, our staff with High Conflict Institute, and also a mediator. And we, we developed it for that age group. Uh, we haven't done something for, for younger kids, but I think, you know, the idea, you know, in today's culture, what's happening is people are learning entertainment skills and being rigid and not compromising and being dramatic and emotional are entertaining, but those aren't relationship skills. Relationship skills are things like having empathy for each other, being mm -hmm. able to make proposals and resolve agreements without having to bring in anger and history and all that stuff. And so I think you're right that really everybody down to elementary school should learn this. And I know some kids do learn mediation skills, uh, conflict manager skills, even as young as third grade. So I know it's possible, mm -hmm. but it's not happening on a very large scale. Well, that might be a new book idea or program idea. <laughs> It is. <laughs> <laughs> because I see that it is so needed. And, you know, these kids are being influenced by all these digital um, things that they have in their lives, their phones, their computers, their tablets and TV. And, it, and it's all about, you know, what's going to get views, the more outrageous, the better, the, the, you know, it's not about how do we solve this correctly, we need to show kids that there are other ways that work better and um you know maybe we can help stem some of the things that are happening i'd love to talk with you about that if you ever do that project i really have a lot of ideas on it and it Excellent. was dear to my heart um so i i'm just so fascinated by all of this bill and you know i i could even see that that these these techniques that you have could be used at the UN um, and so many more places. I, I, I just feel like I want to spread the word far and wide about this amazing work that you've come up with and how can we use it on the planet to help in so many situations. It's, it's incredible. Um, and I, I just, uh, I'm very much appreciative to have you here today um, and to be able to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about this. I, I have one question that came to mind as I was um, yes. um, asking, you, uh, think, hearing you speak, and that is, what if only one of the spouses is my conflict? Do you modify in any way for that? But not really. So in mediation, I don't try to figure out who's the high conflict spouse. Sometimes it becomes pretty obvious. And I also know sometimes it may be both people. But what I teach people that want to learn skills, who are the reasonable person, is to use these approaches. So to, to, to teach the proposal method to the per, their co-parent um, or someone else they're negotiating with. And it may be harder for the other person, but if they stick with it and say, no, 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 just tell me your questions and then say yes, no, or I'll think about it, things like that. We also teach our BIF method, which we spoke about last time I was on. Yes. Can you give us, give the folks a, a little bit more information about that for those who didn't hear that show? Yeah, it's, it's a, a written communication method like emails and texts. It's brief, informative, friendly, and firm. It just keeps it simple. It's like a paragraph, even in response to pages of hostile communication. This keeps things calm. And this is where reasonable people really shine because they're able to stay brief, informative, friendly, and firm, even in response to mudslinging and blame and all of that. So I think these skills are good to be used by everybody. And I think high conflict people can learn these skills. It takes them a little longer, but we do teach them like in our new ways for families method that we have a session online class for separated or divorced uh, parents um, that helps them learn BIF and learn to make proposals and learn to give themselves encouraging statements because that's another big part of this is mm -hmm. yourself without having to just attack other people 
So all of these skills um, are, are easy to learn for reasonable people, and they're often relieved. It's like, oh, I can do that. And that's how to deal with this difficult other person rather than that there's different skills. It's really the same skills, just easier to learn for reasonable people. Right. And what do you handle um, the, the higher conflict uh, spouse if you are able to, you know, uh, call out and see, you know, this, uh, this person is a histrionic or narcissist. If you are able to see those traits, are you telling them the same things or are you handling them completely differently? I'm just curious. No, I'm really telling them the same things. I'm saying what will help in your, yeah. So let's say the pre-mediation coaching, it becomes clear to me sometimes, you know, this person's really narcissistic and I'll go, you know, this will help you by practicing making proposals like this, because this will help you reach agreements and help you move on with your life. Um, Cause I know this is a stressful time. And what's interesting is as obnoxious as narcissists appear, they're really stressed because they keep trying to look superior and no one's really superior. So, you know, it's, it's a, a a false battle, but they're trying to keep up a false image of superiority. Mm. And it's a lot of energy and it's constantly getting dense in it. Um, but teaching these skills, I take the exact same approach and I tell myself, I'll never really know. Um, but these are the skills that both people should use. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, as we wind down here, I'm, I'm so enjoying this conversation, but our time is coming to an end. Uh, what are some of the key paradigm shifts in your conflict resolution methods? You, you alluded to that a little bit earlier, but, you know. Yeah, I think there's, there's really four key things. One is we don't try to give people insight into themselves. We stay focused on the decisions, on what are the proposals, what, what can we do now? So we don't try to say, you know, you're a big part of the problem and you need to change this about yourself. And we don't do that. It doesn't work. It just backfires. So we say instead, let's look at our choices. Let's look at our options here. So not trying to give the other person insight into themselves, even if you think you totally understand where their problems are. Um, second is really steering clear of the past, that the past people get stuck in and so we really try to say present and future focus and no one has to defend the path. People get stuck there. The third is we really try to steer clear of emotions because once you open up emotions, a lot of the unresolved, unhealed uh, past issues for the person, they often feel worse focusing on their emotions. And so we wanna distract and focus on problem solving, what to do now. And it's counterintuitive. You think, well, you know, just ask him how he feels and he'll be glad you asked. But what happens is you ask him how he feels and he's like, oh, terrible. Let me tell you how often. <laughs> so we don't want to open that up. Yeah. And the last is not to label people. Don't tell somebody you have a high conflict personality. You're yeah. the problem or you're the abuser or you're the alienator. Or you're... All these labels don't help. Focus on what to do now. And that's the big part of our shift. Wonderful. Well, I thank you again, Bill. Why don't you tell folks how they can get a hold of you or, or your website, um, you know, how they can get more information on your resources as well. Yeah, so our, our website's highconflictinstitute.com. We also have a second website with a lot of our training for parents and individuals called conflictplaybook.com. So highconflictinstitute.com and conflictplaybook.com. Lots of free articles, lots of skills people can learn. And consultation too, if they want. Um, we do consultations, uh, I do, Megan Hunter, Mike, my uh, colleague with High Conflict Institute, and we're starting to have some of our other trainers do consultation as well. So that's always come to High Conflict Institute website and sign up for consultation if that's what you'd like. Great. 
Well, I hope wow. folks will reach out and take advantage of all these wonderful resources and um, avail themselves to your services as needed. And um, I look forward to seeing what the future brings with you, Bill, and all of the wonderful things that you're putting together. And I thank you again for being on the show today. And next up, we're going to uh, just give you folks some um, ideas on things that you can get on our websites to help you as well. And uh, the first slide you'll see here is at divorcetownusa.com. You can download the Divorcetown USA roadmap, which you see here, which includes an ebook and explains each of the options and helps you understand which one is best for you and your family and outlines the other professionals and or resources you may need along the way, all trying to keep you away from Duke It Out Drive and Bigger Bucks Boulevard and divorce, folks. That's not a place you want to visit when you're going through Divorce Town. We also offer many free articles and videos and our marketplace speeches, some, some of our favorite products and services, and we'll be uh, having Bill's books there as well. Um, at Divorce Town USA, uh, excuse me, divorcemoneymatters.com, you can download your free divorce financial fitness kit. And I created this to help you get better organized and take better control of your money matters during your divorce. And this kit includes an ebook, a working Excel spreadsheet of documents you need to gather when you're getting started, and a list of 50 must ask questions if you're going to be, uh, when you're ready to hire a family family law attorney, things that you really should know to ask about. Also at Divorce Town USA, we sponsor a virtual divorce help and hope support group through meetup.com and we meet once or twice a month via zoom meetings dates and time uh, times are always posted on Divorce Town USA in the events section. And next week, I am happy to say that we'll be sitting down with Christine Cantalina Barnes, who will be helping us answer the questions, who are you really? Who are you really? Join us for a show about self-discovery and healing through and from divorce. And we welcome you back then. I hope you found this week episode of the Divorce Do's and Don't Show helpful, and we look forward to seeing you all next week and every week as we continue improving the way the world divorces one family at a time.